That's been the great thing about my career until the guy I'm playing now is that people went, you're in that, you did Troy, or you did Super Troopers, or you did that. That's what I call being an actor. Hi, my name is Brian Cox, and this is the timeline of my career. My dad, he used to have these amazing New Year's Eve parties, and then at one o'clock in the morning, I would be summoned uh, from my bed, and I would start singing, doing <laughs> Jolson impersonations, Al Jolson, who was very current in the time of the 40s. And it was the effect in the room. It was this thing of creating a sort of harmony within the room, which is the thing that stuck with me. And I realized, this is good. I like this. I like this feeling. I'm sorry. I can't always do what you tell me. The Romanovs are crowing over the new air and the party's in a mess. We must be united. I shall win this vote in spite of you. That was my debut. I think I was 23 or 24. And it was the first film I ever did. There was a long auditioning process, which we all went through. And I, I was so confused. I didn't know what role that I was actually going to be playing in the movie. And they kept calling me back, calling me back. And I walked in, and there was Sam Spiegel and Frank Schaffner, Franklin J. Schaffner. So I kind of asked the question, who am I playing? Am I playing, is it, is it Kerensky or is it, is it Trotsky? And he looked at me and, he, and I swear to God, this is what he said. He said, Kerensky, Trotsky, you're in the picture. And that was it. It was an amazing experience to walk in on that first day and experience the great Freddie Young who won the Oscar for Lawrence of Arabia, you know, and it'd be, suddenly there he was shooting this amazing film. It was just a phenomenal experience for a first movie, you know, and uh, it never left me. He's lost the war. Thousands of soldiers killed and all for nothing. This time, Nicholas has destroyed himself. Did you get my car? I got it, thank you. And how is Officer Stewart? The one who was first to see my basement. Stewart's fine. Emotional problems I here. Do you have any problems, Will? No. I remember talking to Kevin Klein, who had actually turned down the part of William Peterson because he said, that kind of movie scares the shit out of me. He said, I, I wasn't sure I wanted to be involved in it. But I played a lot of characters who are questionable. The interesting thing about those characters is how you make them work, is how you make them human beings. I realized that uh, one had to get inside the skin of somebody like Lecter. I watched a lot of interviews with Ted Bundy. Now, Bundy was an extraordinary man because he was rather brilliant, but he was distracted by his I think his illness, which was, he was a killer, which was horrific, absolutely horrific and inexcusable. But at the same time, one of the key things about actors is you do not judge your character. That's fatal. As soon as you judge your character, you're putting a bias, you're directing it in one way, whereas you have to present the man as he is. My belief is the more you present somebody as he is, the more scarier they become because it all seems so rational, but actually it's deeply disturbed. And that's what becomes disturbing for the audience, is the rationality of somebody's behavior, which is pretty vile. So there was less of the sort of presentational, brilliant stuff that happened in Silence of the Lambs with the extraordinary and wonderful Tony Hopkins, who is a genius actor, I mean, there's no question about it. But my path was a different one. Can I keep this? I haven't decided yet. I'll study them. When you get more files, I'd like to see them too. You can call me when I have to call my lawyer. They'll bring me a telephone. Would you like to leave me your home phone number? No. William. I'm your uncle, Argyle. Well, my great memory of Braveheart is, is Mel Gibson. He was one of the kindest, nicest, most creative people I've ever worked with. I think he was a great director. I think he had great insight. He had a vision that really outstripped the script, because it wasn't, I mean, let's face it, Braveheart wasn't exactly the greatest script ever. Mel made it into something extraordinary, and it really is down to Mel. He really created that film with that amazing cast. I and mean, of course, at the same time, I was being courted to do another film, uh, which was also set in Scotland, like 300 years later, which was Rob Roy. I chose Rob Roy over 
initially over uh, Braveheart, but Mel so desperately wanted me in Braveheart that he accommodated me, and I, he said, well, I want you in the movie, what, what are you gonna play? And I said, well, the only part that's really interesting is Uncle Argyle, but I think you see him as a somewhat cadaverous figure. You can never describe me as cadaverous. And, uh, and Mel said, no, 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 you, that's your part, you can play that part. Good. So I went to Michael Caton Jones, the director. I said, you know, I'm, I'm gonna be doing Braveheart directly after this, in fact, in fact, I didn't even change my hotel room. It was that quick. And uh, he, he said to me, oh, don't do that. I said, why? He said, well, you know, it's another Scottish movie. I said, do you know how many Scottish movies there's been in the last 25th, half a century? Probably about three or four that you can count on your fingers of one hand. And I said, i tell you what. i tell you what I'll do, Michael. Um, I'll be in deep disguise. So I then went to Mel and I said, Mel, I've had this great idea. Maybe I should just play him with one eye, you know, that he's lost his eye. And Mel said, oh, that's a great idea. So, so that's how I was able to accommodate both of them. First, learn to use this. Then I'll teach you to use this. What's his name again? Max Fisher. Sharp little guy. He's one of the worst students we've got. I like working with new and young directors, untried directors. There's a kind of clumsiness about them, and that's okay, because they're just, you know, they're trying it out. Sometimes it can be a pain in the ass. A lot of them are. But sometimes they're quite exquisite. Wes Anderson was of the exquisite variety. And he's an astonishing talent, Wes. And you couldn't say no to Wes. For me, it was a, you know, it was the first of my, in the first of my American movies, so it was important for me to do as many films. I mean, I did a five films in my first, all of which were not particularly wonderful. But then when I finally did something like Rushmore, I suddenly thought, well, here I am working with a genuinely great talent. And I worked with Jason Schwartzman, who was not well, he'd been ill during the filming. You never saw it, he was incredible. And Wes was quite tough on the takes. In fact, I had to say at one point, I said, Wes, if you keep stopping Jason every time he says a line, we're not gonna get a flow on this scene whatsoever. See, I'm quite opinionated. But he was great, he was wonderful. He's just a wonderful director and an original, as he has become more and more, an original talent. We're putting you on what we call sudden death academic probation. And what does that entail? It entails that if you fail another class, you'll be asked to leave Rushmore. In other words, I'll be expelled. That's correct. I got the latest shit list, gentlemen. It's down to Flagstone, Deerlick, and us. And if we keep up these low numbers, you can bet your sweet butts we're going to get the big, ugly axe. Why would you do that film, people said. And I, my thing is always to go to the polaric difference from something. So if I do something, I want to go to the opposite pole of it. And there's nothing more of an opposite pole than Super Troopers. But the film was wacky, it was wonderful. And of course now people, you know, it's a cult movie and people recognize me from that movie. Which makes them not shenanigans at all, really. Evil shenanigans. I swear to God, I'll pistol whip the next guy that says shenanigans. <clears throat> I love that phrase, shenanigans. I won't put up with any of your shenanigans. I just love that. It's such an Irish phrase. Enhance. Enhance. Just print the damn thing. Then you, my friend, don't know crap about life. And why the fuck are you wasting my two precious hours with your movie? Nicholas is a genius actor. The thing that impressed me most about that movie, about adaptation, was Nicholas's the scenes that he did with himself. Because that's a hard thing to do when you're playing two characters. But the way he did it, I mean, it's, it's well worth looking at the movie just to see Nicholas's relationship to his, the twin brother. I thought he was sensational, and I, I do think he's very good. I mean, he's quirky, to say the least. He's a little quirky, but he has got the talent. I have such respect for Robert McKee. In fact, I did Robert's class. I mean, I was just blown away by, and blown away by his passion. Robert was naturally hesitant about it because he thought that, that perhaps the script, Charlie Kaufman's script, was gonna knock him slightly. And I was gonna make sure that wasn't gonna be the case. After we did the big scene of me blasting Nicholas in the, in the theater, you know, 
You don't know anything about life. You don't know the fucking first fucking thing about fucking life. And uh, the first assistant said to Spike, he said, hey, Spike, finally you've got your Obi-Wan Kenobi character, which was Robert. And I told Robert, I said, you know, as far as they're concerned, they think you're Obi-Wan Kenobi. And of course, Robert was delighted by that. And, and then we weren't getting at Robert in any way. We were actually full of praise and celebration. And the film exists as it does. And I'm very proud of it. Have you taken my course before? My brother did. My twin brother, Donald. He's the one who got me to come. <laughs> twin the screenwriter? Yeah. I seem to remember that Quanta Wombosi's name might have come up. I'm not sure what we're talking about. Someone tried to take him out. Tried. And failed. And the director of Born Identity was Doug Lyman, who again I have enormous respect. And he's a hell of a creative. I mean, that amazing sequence where he, fall, he jumps from the top of a, a, an apartment down the middle of this circular staircase. And it was Doug's idea that somebody fell that broke Matt's fall so that he could survive. And it was a genius, genius shot. And I loved working with Matt Damon, who was an absolute delight as, as an actor. And when we were doing it, I thought this could go somewhere. And it did. Doug was always annoyed that I got killed in the second movie, so I said, I'm fine, I can live with it, I'll go on to something else. What, do you have a better idea? Well, so far you've given me nothing but a trail of collateral damage from Zurich to Paris, I don't think I could do much worse. Well, why don't you go upstairs and book a conference room? Maybe you can talk him to death. I like your land. I think we'll stay. I like your soldiers, too. They fought bravely yesterday. Not well. But bravely. Well, Troy was interesting. That's the only part I've ever pursued. I've never pursued anything. I've, I've always allowed it to fall out the way it fell out. But I knew the part was available, and I knew that I was dead right for the role of, of Agamemnon. What happened was I volunteered to fly myself to London uh, to meet Wolfgang Peterson. I think it had been offered, the part had been offered to Ben Kingsley, and I had this meeting, and it went incredibly well. I got the role. It was a great experience, and it was a great cast, and, you know, I remember at one point, you know, just kind of being agog at, you know, at Brad, because, you know, he'd never been in costumes like that. We'd all experienced these great costume epics, because we'd spent most of our time like that. If we'd done the classical theater, we always without pants, you know. Brad walked on and my jaw was down because he was so stunningly beautiful. I mean, I'm, I'm straight, you know, I don't, but I just thought, wow, my God, this guy is stunning. What chance does one have on the screen with this beautiful, beautiful man? I rode a chariot as well. And we had this first assistant who would insist in shouting in the horse's ears, action, and the horses would go like this. So eventually I took his ladder and I put it way up the first is way up the line. And I said, you can do it from back there. I mean, so eventually when he was back there, all you had was action, <laughs> and then you could do it. And we did it. My favorite thing in the world is to stand in front of 7,000 Bulgarian, as they were, Bulgarian hexes, and then to say, charge, pretty phenomenal. <laughs> You need a supermajority, and we can kill it. And we will. You're playing toy fucking soldiers! My manager rang me up and said they are doing this show uh, about a family, a media family, and they're interested in you in playing the head of the family. Uh, I believe, and this was the rumor, it's not definite. Uh, he said, I believe it's a one season part that you would be dead at the end of the first season. I said, oh, okay. And I liked the pitch, I thought it was a really interesting pitch, and I liked the idea, and it seemed to me that it was very much in the line of stuff I had done, but very different. So we had a meeting, which was a virtual meeting. Adam McKay was in LA on the phone, I was in London, and Jesse was on holiday in Italy. And then finally I said, so it's only a one season part, right? And there was this pause on either side of the Atlantic and Pacific and that you could cut with a knife, and finally both voices, ah, no, 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 I think it's gonna be more than one season. 
subsequently, of course, it has been more than one season. I, my instincts are very good. I could feel that there was something really considerable about this. In the first episode, I was originally born in Quebec, so I thought, I'm not very good at Canadian, but I've spent a lot of time in Vermont, so I decided, well, eh, maybe a, sort of that kind of accent around that, the Canadian border will, will do, so I did it. And then finally, in the ninth episode, Peter Friedman, who I'm constantly firing and rehiring in the show, he came to me and he said, um, they've changed your birthplace. And I went, what do you mean? He said, well, you, you're no longer born in Quebec. I said, so where am I born now? Somewhere called Dundee, Scotland? I said, but that's where I was born. And Peter said, well, that's a coincidence. I said, yeah, it's a hell of a coincidence. And then I went over to Jesse, I said, what's going on? He said, we thought it'd be a little surprise. I said, it's a hell of a surprise. As I say, for nine episodes, I've been playing this guy from Vermont, Quebec area. And suddenly, there I am now, throwing arms. Ah, yeah, but you've been here a long time, and you left very early. I said, oh, well, that's reassurance. Thank you. Part of the thing about succession is the improvisation becomes like the bread round the sandwich, which is the scene. So we kind of do that. And sometimes it flows in, and sometimes we don't use it at all. And I think that was also the other thing about succession, that I knew this was something that people had not seen before dealing with truly, describably despicable people, <laughs> in a way, but dealing with it in a way that's examining where we've arrived at in our society. If you look at the show very carefully, you know, he's damned as the most horrible man in the world and what have you. But all he's trying to do is find a successor for his business. That's ostensibly what he's trying to do. And he's hoping that his kids step up to the mark. But week by week, they do not step up to the fucking mark. <laughs> so that becomes the problem of dealing with those children. And they're exceptional. I mean, the, the great thing about Succession is our cast. We have a, a stellar, brilliant cast, and every single one of them just hit the mark every time. The one downside, well, it's also an upset, is I've lost my anonymity. You know, I, you know for years, people would say, you're that guy from, uh, or you were, didn't you do... Uh, and then they would all come up, people would meet me and they'd all come up with different projects. But I was always that sort of bobber and weaver. It just stopped. <laughs> it has come to a kind of full stop. It's pretty much gone according to schedule. That's the interesting thing about my career. I mean, years and years ago, people said to me when I was quite young, it's always gonna be the long haul for you, Brian. I didn't think it was gonna be this long a haul, but uh, I'm still standing or sitting. <laughs>